The following program is a presentation of BaseNet Internet Television, bringing you topics in the way mainstream media won't. BaseNet Internet Television presents As We See It with Fred Boaz and Friends. In Los Angeles, I'm Gene White. And now, to our studios in Boston. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another discussion here on As We Sit. I'm Ed Jupe in Boston, along with Fred Boaz in the Poconos, Holly Hurley out there in St. Louis, Missouri, and Larry the Lobster back here just outside of Boston. Hello, everybody. Hey, Hello. guys. Hello. What do we have going here? Are we going to start with our uh, lobster facts? Yeah, well, well, yeah, why not? Get to, Larry, you had a pet peeve and some, uh, some uh, little-known facts. So oh, we'll, yeah, we'll, we have something new this week. You wanted you to, us, you were, Fred, you wanted to premiere a, a new uh, little segment, huh? Yeah, well, well, well Larry, peeves? I want to start with your little-known facts and go to pet peeve of the week. All right. Uh, but I wonder when we get our coffee break. First one is 14 presidents served as vice presidents. It was John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, Martin Van Buren, Tyler, Millard Fillmore. And A. Johnson, Teddy Roosevelt, Calvin Coolidge, Harry Truman, Richard Nixon, LBJ, Gerald Ford, and George H.W. Bush. What else you got? Number two is the tallest presidents were Abe Lincoln at 6'4", and at 5'4", James, I'm assuming Madison, at 5'4", was the shortest president. LBJ, according to what I first saw, this had a height of six foot, six feet four inches, but his actual height is six feet three and a half inches. Okay, almost that's six it, four. That's where does, where does Bill Clinton fit in? Uh, <laughs> Bill, Bill I, I threw was, him a curveball. Okay, actually, according to what I also saw when I did, is Bill Clinton was also six four. Well, there would be, be a tie between the two of them. Then. Yeah, I, I actually think he's closer to 6'2". But anyway. Well, well, of course. Yeah, it's funny. I, say, I guess that means honesty has nothing to do with how tall you grow. You know, you think Honest Abe. Was yeah, the, Honest Abe was the tallest or one of the tallest. Was Larry, you said that was 14? Yep. No, that's interesting because it was 14 out of the 44 uh, U.S. presidents were also Masons, which is a fact <laughs> a lot of people don't know. Same Ooh, number. Number. Interesting. Hmm. My dad's a Mason. Oh, good. So am I. <laughs> What's I number three on your list? Okay, number three is the oldest president inaugurated was President Ronald Reagan at the age of 69. The youngest was JFK at the age of 43. But there's an asterisk next to that. Go ahead. And then, okay, Teddy Roosevelt, however, was the youngest man to become president at the age of 42. Right. So that makes him younger than Kennedy, then. You're right. well, Kennedy yeah. was the youngest elected. Rose, Teddy Roosevelt became became president after McKinley died of his uh, gunshot wounds. Right. Yeah, right. Because yeah. when he... Because, yep. Because they got here. When he succeeded McKinley, who had been assassinated. There yeah, I, I don't know if you guys have read the book Assassination Vacation, but it talks about all the presidents who were assassinated, and there's some really interesting. That's a good book. Yeah, totally. Well, I think this is this is really timely because the uh, you know everybody's gearing up now for election 2012. Things are getting. Well, let them let them get to number four then. Yeah. What's number four? Okay. Come on, Larry. Number number four is presidents Adam, Jefferson, and Monroe all died on the Fourth of July. And Calvin Coolidge was born on the 4th of July. So go. essentially going into this presidential race, we're looking for gentlemen who are tall, uh, presidents are young, and, uh, and then uh, people who may die on the 4th of July. <laughs> and, and out of that list, not only did Jefferson and Adams die on the 4th of July, they died on the same 4th of July in 1826, which just happened to be the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. Wow, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. 50th, uh, right on the 50th anniversary. Pretty cool. Yeah, that is, that's, that's pretty neat. So, so Larry, obviously, you know, I mean, a lot of people's uh, pet peeve during this election has been some of the bickering that's been going on. I understand you have a pet peeve for us today. Yes, I have a pet peeve. 
which is, okay, if you're originally from a country outside of the United States and you're in your own home and you want to use your native language, whatever that may be, that's fine. But when you leave the house, you know, leave that language, whatever it is, at home. Once you leave the house, speak English. See, spoken like a man who's never been out of the country. I can tell you, when I lived in Spain, if people knew how to speak English, it certainly made my trip a lot easier. Holly, ask me if I have an opinion. Do you have an opinion on this, Ed? Uh, I, I have no opinion on this. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> actually, yeah, I, I agree with you, Holly. Spoken like somebody that's never left the country. Uh, Larry, if you went to a foreign country, and let's use Spain since Holly just brought it up, if you go to Spain... It's not expected that you need to learn Spanish just if you're going to Spain for a couple of days or a couple of weeks or a couple of months even. You'll get by. But wouldn't it be nice to walk up to an ATM or something and at least if you wanted to withdraw some money, the ATM spoke or was written in English so, you know, so that you didn't need to learn Spanish? So why should it be any different to people that speak another language and come to this country? It, I don't, why do I don't they need think... to learn English? I don't think it's really that. What happens is that in this country it's become the norm that we have to provide people with their own language every time they walk into a store, every time they walk into a business, that it's, that it's assumed that they're going to be speaking a foreign language other than English. I mean, I know my mother will tell you that when you go to a place like Switzerland or France, in Switzerland, for example, the cabbies are required to speak four languages to get a license. In the United States, you know, we speak English, and if you're going to do business here, you should know the language. But you know, we should have people that when, – when somebody walks into my place of business or in my office expecting me to serve them in Spanish, that annoys me. Or in any other language because you know, if I go to their country, I can't expect them to do that. No. If they do, it's a – and that's the difference. It's the expectation of – in New York City in the 1980s, it was required that a teacher be bilingual English-Spanish to get a job. And that was only broken because a Korean gentleman said, wait a second, my kids don't speak any, either. And he sued one. So, you know, Spanish is not the second language of the United States. And it's, you know, the official language is, is English, whether people know it or not. There was a vote taken back in the 1700s. I wish I could find the information. I've been looking for it. They took a vote in the Second Continental Congress when they wanted to divorce ourselves from the United States government, from the uh, British government, excuse me. And by one vote, we're not speaking German. So, you know, it, it, you remember the history of the country. My parent, my mother came here from Switzerland, where, where German was the primary language. My father came here from France, and they both adapted to this country. But and then you met my parents; they both speak English. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's one thing to speak English, but I mean, he, here's the thing: if we want to be in a global economy, if we want to compete in this in the world that we're in, the truth of the matter is, Spanish is quickly gaining on English as the most spoken language in this country. And countries that have that are multilingual typically do better than us in you, almost. You have to learn to adapt. Yeah, you have to adapt or die. That's what world You know, I, I took three years of Spanish between high school and college. And to this day, I could speak a little of it. I could understand it much, much better. You could stick me in the middle of a Spanish conversation. And I think, well, at least Fred and Larry have both seen me in this position where we've been around some Spanish-speaking people and I've kind of like told you sort of what they were talking about, you know, just in in passing. I, I could understand Spanish and I could speak it a little bit. Okay, now that was years ago back in school. So I think I think even then I was I was willing to adapt at seventeen, eighteen years old or something and say, Well, uh, I'm sure it was my guidance counselor or something that said, you know, says Spanish in your lifetime is going to become, uh, you know, very prevalent in this country and it might be the language you want to choose to learn. So that's why I did it. And sure enough, you know, wherever you go, they speak Spanish. And it's, it's kind of cool that I could understand enough just so that if I'm immersed in the middle of a conversation, I'm not totally left out. Yeah, well, it, I think, I think that's not my objection, though. Important. Yeah, but my thing is, I do think that it should be on signs and things like that because if you want global business, you want global travelers, it just makes it easier for them to be here. You know, I mean, think about when you've been in other countries, when you're traveling somewhere, if the signs that point to where you need to go are in your language, you can read them, and that makes life a lot easier when you're abroad. 
Well, they're also in their language in English because English is the most uh, used right. language in the world. It is the language of the air. Every If you have an Aeroflot airliner flying from New York City to Moscow, talking from the pilot in the cockpit to Moscow International Airport, they're speaking English. It's also the, air, the language of the sea, English is. That uh, any radio transmissions under normal circumstances done in English. My thing is not that, that you can't have lang- you can't have multi-language signs in every language in the world. You have a no. sign 18 feet long. You know, most of your signs have we have the international road signs. When you go in, the sign that the the signage, the material should be available. But what language do you use? Do you use Spanish? Do you use Lower Slobovian? Well, I I I would tend to say that it's location specific. There are towns in, like, North Bergen, New Jersey or something, where the signs are English and Korean or something. Uh, In Quincy, Massachusetts, a high Chinese population, signs are English and Chinese. So I I think it it kind of goes on whatever the prevalent language is in the location are. Part of the problem is I've, I've had to post signs in my office that said that are English and Spanish in a location where there are no Spanish-speaking people because you're trying to be politically correct. Yeah, yeah, that's... You know, it, it can't be just Spanish. It, you know, if I have a high Korean population, I provide, I will provide a Korean, you know, the, the signs in Korean. And I don't have a problem with that. But when you have an all-white community or an all-English-speaking community, why would you even think about, about, about something like that? If you need to put something in Spanish, I, ha- I, I need to have it accessible. I need to be able to say, yes, here's the signs in English or and in Spanish and in Korean, and they have those. But the idea, the part of the problem is that we have people coming to this country who speak foreign languages and are not taking the time or making the effort to learn the language of the country they're in. I've had people come to my office and, uh, and just stand there because they can't make themselves understood. I, mean, I don't understand what they're saying. And that bothers me because I, would, I understand going to other countries. You know, you walk into a, into a Spanish bodega and you want bread. I mean, I can make myself understood. I know, I know, I, I joke that I can get my butt kicked in five languages. I know enough of other languages to make myself think so I can get around. That's my responsibility going to those, uh, going to those, uh, those countries. But when you come here and all you speak, you go from a Spanish speaking home to a Spanish speaking bodega to a Spanish speaking school, back to a Spanish speaking uh, coffee shop, back to a Spanish speaking, and you don't speak English in a country where they, where English is the prevalent language. That's a problem because right, our, country is so, our country is so vast that the only thing we have is a common language. Keep but let's address Larry's pet peeve again. His pet peeve stemmed from this ATM that he went to. And what, what was it, Larry, that Spanish was the first choice or English was the uh, first choice, but then it gave you these other options? No, actually... English is the first choice. Okay, okay see, so I, 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 yeah, I honestly don't see how there's a problem then. You know, it defaults to English, which you're in America. Okay, this is Fred's point. It defaults to English. Now, if I happen to have just come here from Spain, Espanol is also another choice on there. So now I could read it in my language. Well, I, I don't see I a problem think, with that. I think that is kind of traumatizing to hear you say like that that bothers you because we're getting trounced by a lot of other countries. That doesn't country. bother me. I said that's fine to me. No, no, I mean I said it defaults it defaults in English, I'm which is how it should be because to Larry was Oh, what, what okay, I'm sorry. Go about. ahead. <laughs> I mean, I'm, no, go ahead. Go address. Speak to Larry. Then go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, I love. I'm vehemently agreeing with you here. Um, no, the you know my my thing is like you know I'm going to China soon, and a big a big deal right now in the world economy is that China is just growing hand over fist economically because they are they're basically working with all kinds of other economies. They're making it easy for themselves to be imported and exported. They are they're just huge. Their economy right now is exploding. And a big part of it is you go to China and you have a Bank of America card. You can go to any ATM in China and pull out money in English at their bank and, you know, and and it'll do the correct conversion rate, a fair conversion rate for the, you know, for what the conversion rate is on national scale. They're not going to trump it up like they do at some airports. You know, they make it so easy for you that it's almost like you have your bank in China. I mean, tell me that's not, that doesn't encourage. That's how it should be. Yeah, that's what I think. It, 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 it should that, that when you go to China, an ATM should be in Chinese with a with a selection on the side for English, French, Spanish, German, whatever. And you push the language you want. The sign comes up in your language, and you and you're able to do business in English. 
in your yes, case. I, I may be willing to be like, you know, ni hao, you know, uh, ni shu lemon, you know, I may be willing to ask how are you in Chinese, but I certainly don't want to wager getting money out, getting the wrong amount of money out of my bank account. You know what I mean? <laughs> what do you mean it's a hundred thousand dollars? Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, I didn't know that the R&B converted that way. <laughs> you know, like, well, I no, I mean, the, the, that but the that, but that's, that's the thing that what, what we're talking, what, what bothers me and getting on Larry's pet peeves, when I pick up a phone and I call someone and it says press one for English. That bothers me. Or, yeah, because it should have just defaulted there. Or why? Or don't press one for for don't press anything for English. It should be English. Press one for something else then. Press one for Spanish, three for German, four for Korean, five for whatever. That's okay right. That. Well, that's right. Because I called Comcast at one time, and it said press one for Spanish. That's how it should be. No, actually, no. no. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's right. Yeah, right. it defaults to English, and then Spanish. and then you no, press actually, the numbers for other options. Wait, 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 no, actually, I'm a press one for Spanish. No, correction. No, wait, no, wait a minute. No, I got correction. I got that wrong when I called Comcast one time. It said press one for English. Now that would bother me. Yeah, and, I'd and say, that and, I, and I that bothered me. And it, 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 it should. And that's the because, way. That's the way things should bother you. Because because what happened is, I wanted English. I don't want Spanish. So. I just sat there and... But you know what's so ironic about that is they're speaking to you in English. They say, yeah. for English, press 1. Well, why am I pressing 1 for English? You're already speaking to me in English. Yeah, exactly. That's right. <laughs> and then they tell you to press 8 for Spanish, and they repeat it in Spanish. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. Spanish, oh, press well. 8. Interesting pet peeve, though. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, I thought it was pretty cool. And then there are... And then... And then you have the self-scan registers at the CVS over here. Okay, okay now, which one those? Okay, now, I noticed you can also choose English or Spanish. Now, and I and there are several, you know, customers, you know, they speak two languages, English and Spanish. And I figure if they speak English, choose English. Forget, forget hearing your transaction being conducted in Spanish. Larry, that's not always possible because, like, my father, for example, my father was raised in, was raised, grew up and raised in France. So for him, even after all the time that he's here, Fran French is still easier for him to translate to uh, his native language. deal with because it's his native language. Some for some people, even though they speak English, it's easier for them to conduct to conduct business in their foreign language. I don't have a problem with that. I don't care if they do it lower Slobovian. I don't care as long as when I get there, the first choice is English. I'm happy. But I've also noticed that uh, um, some of the some of the customers that choose Spanish, they speak English very well. So what do they need the Spanish for if they speak English so well? Fred just told you. Sometimes it's I just, just told you. And yeah. it's their choice. They that, have a right to choose whatever language sure. they want. That makes no difference if they speak English so well. Then well, just I I know enough. English. Like I said earlier, I know enough Spanish to get by. Why can't I choose to hit the Spanish button if I chose to conduct my business in Spanish then? Why do I need to conduct my business in English if I yeah, choose not to? Yeah, you want to practice. Right. You know. It's... So then do it, so then do it my, so then you do what my father did before my parents took a trip to China. He had several tapes and he was actually learning the Chinese from these tapes. So when he got there, he could speak Chinese. Yeah, well, I mean, my dad did that with Gaelic too. But listen, I've been—I have a language partner at school, and I've been working on Chinese on and off with him for a couple of, for a few months. I can barely ask how to say something in Chinese in Chinese. It is not an easy language to learn. There are sounds and pronunciations we don't use in English, and you know, I mean, I appreciate that your father had time to learn stuff, but you shouldn't be prohibited from traveling to other countries because you're not going to learn their entire language in a couple of months. Right. I think I think having options is always better than not having options. Oh yeah, well, my grandmother ran a language school in Manhattan for a lot of years, and it's you know, I mean, and she would tell you the same thing. She'd always hire native speakers because they always taught better. She also wrote several books. So, I mean, I deal with it. I've dealt with it my entire life. You know, multiple languages in one home, and it you know I I wish I I wish that my parents had done a better job in teaching me other languages besides English. Yeah, well, I, th I think that I think that went well. <laughs> I, I don't know that Larry is going to agree with us that it went well, but uh, but it's his pet peeve, and he's certainly entitled to his pet peeve. He's entitled you know, to you know, it. Larry, every now and again, we'll come up with one so that you can yell at us about our pet peeve. <laughs> yeah, we'll find something. Now, why, now why would I want to yell at you? 
Aww. 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 Welcome to Holly and the Lobster. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Fred, what do we have uh, What do we have first on our real list here? Our real list, Poxitani Phil may not spoil oh, is it, our Bobby, is it, our Bobby is it that Bobby time of the year again? It's you know, let me, give you my, let me give you my pet peeve. Here no. we go. Well, now, let's see, now here's your, here's your chance not to agree with me, Larry. Groundhog Day is one of our most useless holidays. I have never had any use for Groundhog's Day. The stupid rodent is wrong more than it's right. And besides, who cares if we have six weeks of winter, 18 weeks of winter, whatever the heck the choices are. I just think that it's another dumb, lame excuse for another holiday, and who needs it? Wait, I say second. do I'm away with Groundhog Day. day. I got to work that day, so it's not a holiday. So I say do away with Groundhog Day. That's my pet peeve of the day. It's, it's a stupid day. holiday. If they would let me off work on Groundhog Day, I'd be a huge fan. <laughs> Look, if it weren't for Groundhog Day, you would have never had the movie. You would have never had the Bill Murray movie. And good, because that was a horrible yeah. movie, too, so and nothing that movie lost. that is awesome. That oh, please. Awesome. Terrible. Awful. Terrible. And every, and every morning, he kept, every oh morning, he, and every morning, he kept waking up to the same Sonny and Cher song. Terrible. I got you, babe. Anyway, so that's my pet peeve. So, Fred, <laughs> what about Groundhog's Day? My, since my pet you're on peeve it. is that Fred doesn't like Groundhog's Day. <laughs> I have to like the Groundhog. But out of Sunbury, <laughs> out of Sunbury Pennsylvania, the Groundhog will have to sit, spend a little bit of time in the sun seeing a shadow. Uh, some other year, because the extended forecast for Groundhog Day calls for clouds. No shadow, no more six weeks of winter. And it looks like next Thursday, which is February 2nd, by the way, there's a potential for a storm center. I looked this up this morning. For an, e a north e uh, an east-northeast towards the Tennessee Valley to the Virginias that can spread clouds across Pennsylvania. On temperature, on temperature, uh, on Wednesday, temperatures are, gonna, are supposed to be 32, but warm up steadily throughout the day. We're talking almost 50s in Pennsylvania that day. But from September to, uh, to now, the valley where, in, where uh, Sunbury is located, the temperatures have been roughly in the, about four degrees above normal, far from this time of year. If you only count, if you count only winter days, December 31st to now in, uh, in meteorological terms. I thought he was in Puxatawney. What's a Sunbury? Oh, well, that's what that's what he reported out of, and Pox and Connie's in Sunbury County, oh. Sunbury area. But they're talking about the fact that the jet stream is be is keeping the cold air in Canada where it can stay in Canada, as far as I'm concerned, and it's keeping the cold air from coming down. Bringing now we've had our snow, we've had our winter. Now let's go back to 70 degrees. But that's that day. Uh, it, it, the groundhog. Okay, enlighten me. If he sees his shadow, it's what? And if he doesn't see his shadow, it's what? If he sees his shadow, he goes back in the home in six more weeks of winter. And if he doesn't see a shadow, winter's over. Winter, winter's real cold, real cloud, or something like that. <laughs> anyway. Like I still, I, well, that's my pet peeve. I'm, I'm as much of a fan of Groundhog Day as you <laughs> are. You know that. <laughs> I love that movie. So yeah, I, hate, I hate the day. Yeah, I can understand that. I think have I think I think we can agree that if we got off for Groundhog Day as a it holiday, it might be a little different. Be able to support it, but what else has been happening this week? Uh, didn't the Supreme Court uh, do a do a ruling on something about the GPS and police cars? Yeah, this is okay. This is fantastic. So there, so this uh, drug dealer, right, by the name of, or well, alleged drug dealer by the name of Antoine Jones, took his car. Uh, and he had taken his car into the shop to, I believe he was like getting his wiper blades replaced, like something really small. Um, and he found underneath his front bumper a little black box. And he he actually posted, I, I happen to know, I have a little inside info on this because of a Subaru form that my husband follows. He actually posted a picture of it online. And a couple of guys on the forum said, listen, that is like a security grade GPS system. You, you need to go get a lawyer. Like, whatever's going on, you're going to need a lawyer for it if that thing's on your car, right? So he goes he goes and he gets a lawyer, and essentially, uh, you know, they the ruling, the, somehow the case gets all the way up to the Supreme Court, and the entire Supreme Court votes that it is illegal for uh, law to, for anyone in law. Yeah, a private investigator, anybody uh, like that. Yeah, and, it should, be, and it should be illegal. Yep, had said it's it's illegal for them to do it without a warrant. It's considered a search, and uh, and therefore they can't do it without a warrant. So they can't uh, no, they can't uh, without the express permission of the court uh, track someone like this particular gentleman. But you can't. Uh, I mean, they, they have no reason. If, if this guy's driving down the street going to his gas station, they got no business tracking him doing that. 
I mean, we, we, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if you want to call it a search, but I mean, that, that's an, if nothing else, an invasion of his privacy. Yeah, I mean, well, it would be the same to... going the private investigator route. It would be like just what most PIs do is mostly matrimonials. And, you know, if you're chasing around a husband or wife to see if they're cheating on the other spouse, well, you do good old-fashioned investigation work. You stake them out, you stake out their job, you stake out their house, and you tail them around, you drive around behind them, and you do good old investigation. Uh, you know, now all of a sudden you have to take it into the 21st century where you just essentially bug their car, and now you could sit in front of your computer somewhere and just track them that way. No, get out there and do it the old gumshoe way and just surveil them oh, like you used to see do. That, that's not my problem. My problem is the police are, are surveilling this guy. Well, it's the same kind of but, thing, though. My, that's, that my point's the same. Yeah, you know, it, it's really, I don't, I don't ultimately know if it's any different if you surveil them by a GPS device or if you surveil them with your own two eyes. But, but... Well, now, don't, no, if you're surveilling you... this guy when he's the parking lot of CVS, going from CVS to Grand Union or whatever the hell it is, that's a little different than if you're surveilling him when he's dealing drugs. Yeah. Okay. Now, don't be so don't be so quick to say like you know that 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 this this guy didn't have reasonable cost. You know, they didn't have reasonable cost to want to do this. Oh, didn't they didn't, didn't have a yeah, but they found a hundred kilograms of cocaine and a hundred and I'm sorry and one million dollars when they they raided a house because apparently they had tapped his phone. They had done all all kinds of other things like I mean they had they had a real reason to believe it but that but the problem was they, they just did it bass backwards instead of getting the uh, the warrants or the court orders first they went and they bugged it and did all of this first exactly well and the scary thing about this is you know they do believe that even the Supreme Court said they feel like the problem is it's this particular ruling is going to shade doubt on cases like this one. It's specifically narcotics cases, typically where the FBI uses this particular method. And they said, yeah, it's going to be harder for them to get their job done, but we're not willing to have this level of invasion of privacy in order to have that handled. Let's get Ron Paul on, see what he has to say. You oh, know, he'd be all I, over yeah, this. Okay. <laughs> maybe, we, maybe we should ask him what he thinks about the... Um... The red light cameras here in Brookline, which with a, used to with which used, a tinfoil hat, well, which, used to, which used to be on 24/7, then some dingbat motorists started complaining that's an invasion of privacy, and they are wrong. If you have your car parked off street and you drive the car up out of your parking garage and onto the street, privacy no longer exists in your car. Um, well, I don't know about that, but <laughs> if you want, look, I mean, if the, if the light's red, you blow the light, and they get you with a camera. Shame on you. Shame on you. Right. That's right, because once you that, drive that, the car, that's a, little, that's a little different than a GPS unit in your car. Yeah, and yeah. it's a lot different than say them specifically utilizing those to like search inside. Like if they could, if they could hone in or zoom in those cameras to search inside someone's car that's parked on the street. Yeah, again, the comparison with the two, this this GPS device was put specifically on that car for a specific reason to track a particular person or persons. The well, red that, light camera, it's just looking at every single car that goes through that intersection, and you just happen to do something wrong. It wasn't pinpointing you. Yeah. As a matter of fact, because that red light camera was on 24-7, a little after 2 a.m. on a Tuesday morning, there was a woman who was forced into the back of this pickup truck and was raped. I and, remember that story. Right. And because of that, they caught the guys. And right. that's why well, And that's why it should still be right. on 24-7. Well, I don't know why the town would turn them off from being on 24-7. I would have told the people to go screw because yeah, I mean, motors, I, I that, but I think that's a hugely different case because this was targeted. Because, this was put on his car when he took it in no, for no. team maintenance. Yeah, you know? I mean that that worked out for the best, Larry, because they were able to catch somebody doing something wrong. Okay. Because well, and somebody doing something but, wrong in an open forum too. I mean, right. you know, that's an intersection with a red light on a public street. Right. Uh, you know, you're you're right, Holly. You know, we're talking apples and oranges. This was specifically a GPS device put on a particular car. But, Whereas, like I said, that intersection with the cameras, it's observing everything that's going on at that intersection. So it's two different see, things. But you see, someone has to tell these dingbat motorists who are convinced that I don't care where I am driving my car. If I'm sitting in my car, I want privacy. I don't want some red light camera. 
watching me. Well, that's too bad. Then don't drive your car on the street. Well, people forget that driving is a privilege and not a right, and the state has a right to put cameras up anywhere they want. That's right. They do it in New York City. Like they when do it we, all like, the time. They do it. They do it in Pennsylvania all the time. It's it, like, it's the idea. It's the idea of a cop with with radar on the side of the road. Same idea. Like, like just about every time that we've been done in New York City, I would look up and I would see CCTV cameras just about everywhere. I, you know, I think this is like anything else, though, Larry, in that, like, I, I'm all for it, you know, as a red light camera, I don't have any problem with it. But there is this sort of like, fifth element question at play of like, how far does this go? It, it's one thing, you know, if, if, if all public property everywhere was had security cameras, sure, it'd make you feel safer to a certain extent, but none of that stuff is flawless. None of that stuff is foolproof. And at what point do you not, and at what point does it become Big Brother? At what point do you not feel safe? Well, you, you know, know what, I, gonna... I, think it's, I think it's too late for that. In a city like New York City, you could walk down Fifth Avenue from 62nd Street to 32nd Street and theoretically never be out of eyeshot of a camera. They, you know, the police through court orders and all, if a crime was committed, they could physically watch you walk from 62nd Street to 32nd Street down Fifth Avenue because there's a camera on you every step of the way on every building. And and it's there, it's there for protection. But it's also, I mean, uh, the, the cameras that Larry's talking about are there specifically to watch people running red lights. I mean, it's a safety feature. People, you know, I mean, if, you don't if it want, happens you don't want, to catch a crime, and it catches a crime, like in Larry's that, case. If, if people forget that running a red light is a crime. Speeding is a crime. They don't look at it that way. Right. Well, if I want to drive my car, well, you know, if you want to drive your car on the street, then don't run the red lights and get caught by the camera. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think that's true, but I, I do think it's, I know that, as you said, you know, Ed, we've gone too far with it at this point. It's not yeah. like, you know, I... But no it's, turning it's, back now, right. Yeah. It's, an, it's a scary thought. I don't like to think about it too much. <laughs> well, then let's uh, talk about something else. All right. Jesse Jackson. <laughs> oh, we yeah, haven't. Speak, I don't think we've talked speak, about him yet on As We Say. Jesse, speaking of scary thoughts, Jesse Jackson is a pro to consider protesting the Grammy Awards. Because okay. they're going to be cutting out. Why would he want to protest the Grammy Awards? Oh. They're trying to cut out certain. Uh, from, they're dropping, they want to drop the categories from 109 to 78. The biggest overhaul in, in Oh, 50, and let me guess. It just happens to be rap categories that they're dropping? No, That's, it's the hilarious thing. Well, one of them is, I think the one he's probably specifically in arms about, up in arms about is they're dropping one of the gospel categories, the traditional okay. gospel category. Mm -hmm. And and I think he has a point. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that that would be one that I would drop. Yeah, but that's, I mean, you know. That, yeah, that's, that's pretty serious. Yeah. Is, they had to cut something. The award show's gotten, I mean. I mean, I mean, gospel rap, gospel rap. You know, I'm going to tell you which one to cut. I mean, it's a no-brainer in my mind. <laughs> Why would you cut gospel in the case of not cutting, say, rap? Not saying that that's the case, but, you know, just making a comparison. I, uh, gospel isn't something that would be top on my list to cut. Well, I think rap often falls under another. Well, you know what? I should look it up before I say that because I think rap often often falls under another category. Well, rap is hip hop now. Rap yeah, as a, leg a legitimate. I mean, some of the ones that they cut were traditional gospel, children's spoken word albums, Zydeco or Cajun. So obviously, he has a feeling that like th these are. I think his problem, and I I see his logic, but at the same time, I also see where the Grammys have been going longer and longer and longer, and eventually you got to cut it you down. You have to cut something. Every album can't win a Grammy, you know? But, but every, uh, and every category can't be a Grammy contender either. I mean, you know, yeah. I mean, and I'm not saying anything about, uh, about something. I mean, you got, you got pop, you got rock and country, you got traditional gospel, children's spoken word albums, Zydeco, a cage of music albums. Yeah, which best I, I yeah. guess that's Best yeah. classical crossover album. In addition, men and women compete to head in the same vocal. I mean, it gets to the point where you have 800,000 categories for nine albums. Well, I understand, but if you look at the name, I, I can see where he's coming from, too, because if you look at the names of these, these I mean, Zydeco and Cajun is uh, correlated with a certain cultural heritage. Uh, traditional gospel, obviously, as a, as a pastor, he's going to have a problem. As a reverend, he's going to have a problem with that. You know, so I can see where he's coming from. But Absolutely. I, I kind of agree with him for a change. Yeah, well, I know. I like, I don't want traditional gospel cut because I think those albums get press. And his point, too, is that these kinds of albums kind of only get real traction as far as a big audience is concerned at the Grammys. 
and it's it's kind of cool sometimes because these artists that nobody would listen to otherwise sees them on the Grammys and they go, oh, what is that? And then they check it out. You know, you know and if there's too many different categories or something, maybe a whole nother awards. Start combining them. Or, or a, a whole nother award show, so to speak, needs to be done. Just like in our case with podcasts and webcasts and everything, you know, you now have the webbies and things like that. You have award organizations or organizations that award shows to best comedic podcasts and things like that. So, you know, if you're being overrun with categories, start something else. Yeah, but you can't, I mean, you have, you have rock. You have alternative rock. You have this rock, that rock, Latin rock, Spanish rock. You have all kinds of rock that's out there, and you want to put a category that's at 18, and it's 18 categories long in itself. Yeah, you and the award show is six hours long. Right, and they need to combine the categories that all, a Cajun music, I have nothing with a problem with Cajun music. I really don't. I like some of it. But combine it with something else, maybe combine it with Southern, Southern rock, or whatever it is, or leave it to itself. Combine the gospel as gospel. Cajun is Cajun. Right. Rock is rock, and make it categories. Because, like you said, everybody can't win in every in every category. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's the difficult thing. Because as a musician, I go, oh, you know, I want all these people to see the light of day. But also, as a consumer, you understand nobody is going to watch 109 awards. You know, a lot of these they give outside of the award show anyway because right. there's just not room. No, they're not even covered. I yeah, still want. Sorry. I still want to know that what church is Reverend Jackson a uh, a pastor in? Well, I was looking it up, and I couldn't find a specific church. Not to say that he hasn't been at some point, but currently, pastor. I don't believe that he's affiliated with a particular church. But you don't give up your reverendship, quote unquote, just because you're not the pastor of a particular church. Oh no, so, I, I didn't say that. I mean, his uh, organization is called the Rainbow Push Coalition. Right. I just, I just don't think he's the pastor of a particular church right now. <laughs> wait, wait. What? One of you guys said something hilarious when we were talking about the story. I want, uh, you, he was the church of whatever's happening right now. He's, he's the church pastor. of what's happening now. <laughs> what's happening now? Yeah. He's. actually that was actually a church that was used by Flip Wilson as a co as a comedian when he did his uh, mm. Reverend Leroy. Right. And he was a, a, a Reverend of the Church of What's Happening Now. So uh, <laughs> our respects out to Flip, Flip Wilson, who has gone from us, and now uh, we pay our respects to him, and well, may he rest in peace as well. But the Church he also, of What's he also Happening Geraldine, Now. So. Yep, Geraldine. Also, I feel like the Rainbow Push Co Coalition is just the wrong title for so many reasons. Uh, yeah, yeah, it, it well yeah. the the whole rainbow thing kind of the connotation is uh, the gay and lesbian community. But that, but I'm sorry. The problem with that to... is that, that they that they chose that and they chose the rainbow after the Rainbow Push Coalition came out. Yeah, but the rain, but but still, somebody should have thought about that going into it. Like, I mean, I don't know. I, it just it sound. I mean, at some point. I hate to break the news to you tomorrow that we're changing the name of our network to the Rainbow Network next week. Uh, I you didn't get the memo. The Rainbow Network, because I feel like the Rainbow Network is very respectful. The Rainbow Push Coalition sounds like a huge non-discriminate orgy. <laughs> you know. Just, yeah. No, but the thing is. <laughs> The reason he chose rainbow was because it encompasses all colors, which is great. But what I want to know is why did Glad choose the rainbow? Because it isn't, it isn't everybody. And, 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 and again, like you said, it has some bad connotations to it if you don't know what it is. Well, not bad per se, just not what they're not in alignment. Uh, not, with not what Reverend Jackson would want it to have, I'm sure. Correctly, and that that's what bothers me is like I I am all for the rainbow for what it means now and for what it's for, but I I feel like he he has a very specific. Uh, for the most part, aside from the fact that he seems to pop up every time he has an opinion about something, you know, the, the, his goal was had to do with the advancement of a certain of a certain agenda, and I don't feel like the Rainbow Push Coalition suits his his agenda in all ways. I think it's well, counter to his agenda. If he, if he had called it what the agenda would really be, he'd be called a racist. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not it. It is, it, it, it is what it is. I mean, you know, he uh, argued with, uh, with, at the time with then Governor Pete Wilson about the fact that Governor Wilson took uh, race off of applications in California, and he didn't think it was fair because of affirmative action. And Pete Wilson said, "Look, you can't have it both ways, Reverend Jackson. You can't have equality in, in applications and have affirmative action. It just doesn't work." No, if this is his actual church, or if it's the title of an article that I'm looking at, but what I'm looking at says, Jesse Jackson's Church of Instant Forgiveness. 
That's what that's what he calls his ministry, but uh, it it's not a brick and mortar called, church. Exactly. Okay. It also says on his Wikipedia and on a couple other sites that he's never actually had his own church. He has there are some other things he's a part of, but he has been the leadership. He's been in the leadership position of a church, but he's never actually been the pastor of a church. He's been like an executive director of something in a Baptist and, church. And like right. I said, that doesn't take away from his pastorship or his right. no, whatever you want to call it. I mean, once you're made a reverend and, and you earn a title, I mean, it, it is what it is. Yeah, but just because you don't I have a brick-and-mortar church doesn't I'm mean asking, anything. You know, does he have a brick-and-mortar church somewhere? Yeah, no, I think I think that's true. I mean, I certainly believe that. You know, I I grew up in the church, and one of the reasons I chose not to go into quote unquote ministry is I said, you know, the whole the whole point of of what the church is trying to do is that you know Christ didn't come for the people who were saved; he came for the other people, you know, <laughs> the ones who weren't yet yeah, needed who needed to come. So, you know. what else you got in the news this week? Well, obviously, this one's just going to make Fred check out for a solid hour. But, you know, Seal and Heidi Kuhn split this week. I think I just heard okay. the door crash. Fred, are you still there, Fred? Who cares? Thank you. I got my piece in. Thank you. Yeah. That's, 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 anytime, anytime I have entertainment news, Fred's always like, Fred's who the first cares? one out of the room. That's not true. Eh? I mean, it's entertainment news, then it's who cares. I mean, I mean Seal, oh. Seal and Heidi Klum, who cares if they break up? How is that affecting anybody out there? I mean, Who's who cares? And they made this, they made a big stance of being, of how you should stay married in Hollywood and how they wanted to be, you know, they, they kind of set themselves up as an example of what they thought the consummate life should be. And, you know, Heidi was always saying that, you know, women should have children. They should be in touch with their body and all this other stuff. Well, you've got all these children together and now you're going to split up. And I mean, I, I don't believe that for every couple staying together is the right thing to do, but I think if you're going to make it your thing, then fight for it. Pierce you Morgan know? spent an hour with him on CNN the other night, and I got basically nothing out of the interview other than maybe coming away liking Seal a little bit more. He's one I'm of those types cares? of personalities. Yeah, he's one of those types of personalities that I was like, always like, who cares? What's a Seal? I'm not looking at his name, just like, what, what's what's a Seal? What's a Seal guy? But so I, I learned something about him, but he didn't he didn't as most people do. He danced around the issues and, and he, I don't know, it was kind of like a, one of these. Uh, Tony Mazuko has a famous comment. He says, I just spent an hour of my life that I'm never going to get back. Well, you know, so, so, you know, so Fred, you felt like he really danced it. He didn't, oh, Ed, rather, you felt like he really danced around the issue. He didn't really come full circle. He didn't talk about the personal stuff, which I think is actually kind of classy, to be honest with you. The big question that everybody seems to be asking is, you know, Seal has a new album coming out. And how much is, you know, everybody knows that when it comes to celebrities, personal drama tends to lead to enough ticket sales uh, for most of them. However, you know, if they have, if they're considered the bad guy in the situation, sometimes it can hurt their their overall image. It can hurt their, their uh, release dates. It can hurt their numbers. So I, I'll be curious to see if this helps or hurts him. I, I think it's, I just think a divorce can be very charged. And I think if they handle it well, both of them could probably come out on top. Well, you know, I've heard things about their marriage over the, I guess they've been together about eight years or so. Supposedly, uh, there's been some talk that, you know, he might have been a, a little rough to her or something in the manhandling sense, so to speak. And you're, talking, I, I, you're talking about abuse. Let's use the word. And I was at uh, the supermarket today, and I saw one of those uh, checkout newspaper rags, and the headline was, you know, something to the effect of that, that, well, that's why it danced around it, Fred. It, it didn't even say it like normally these rags would. It just said, you know, there's been some issues in their private life in the past, you know, that Heidi doesn't necessarily want to come out and so on and so forth. So, you know, it, it was inferring the whole abuse thing, but even these rags didn't go there, but just inferring that this might be what the problem is in their marriage. Well, well, I'm, I'm going to hope. Unless, unless, unless they've had police reports and things like that, you're not going right, to have right. any, any substantial, uh, any substantial like, like the uh, O.J. Simpson thing with, with Nicole. They had police reports. They had physical pictures of her. They don't. They may or may not have that proof yep. with Seal and with Heidi Klum. So they're, so they're inferring it, and that's okay. The problem I have is that many Hollywood marriages wind up like this because you have two insecure people who are getting married. My career isn't doing as well as yours is. It it tends to be. It seems prevalent in that industry 
that marriages don't last very long. That normally you see the marriages that last a lot, and, and I can't say this about all of them, but many of them are when one person is show business, the other person's not. Well, and, and you know, as much as I hate agreeing with Fred, I got to say, I, you know, I was an actress for a long time in my life. As you guys know, I have my equity card, did it for a living. And I, I, there's a very big part of me that is that personality. And I can say you don't go into a, in a career of being someone else every day if you're completely entirely secure in your own skin. You know, there is some, there is some level of imagination and some level of drama that comes with a personality that wants to do that for a living. And if you have two of those in one relationship, it can be pretty explosive. I never sought out other musicians or actors to be with because I found it was too much of that same personality, you know, and I mean, that's anecdotal. It's, I, I know some people do wonderfully and really flourish in that environment, but I think a lot of the evidence is to the contrary and people say, oh, it's the business that breaks them up. Yeah. I mean, it's not easy living away from your spouse. A lot of spouses do that in this day and age because of money, you know, but it's not easy being away from your spouse. It's certainly not easy kissing other people for money, but at the end of the uh, day, how, how much money? Oh, millions sometimes. What, what do you do if you're James Carville and Mary Matlin and, and you're both political correspondents and political pundits and, and one's a Republican and one's a Democrat? Yeah. You, you got to wonder. I always, I always wonder how those two get along. And they've been uh, married I, forever. I am very curious about that. But I think a big part of it is, you know, people blame the industry. And I think politics of any industry will break you up. You know, that will. You know, the one that Carville's in. Yeah, they've been together forever, those two. Exactly. And I, but I think it has to do with the personality. And I think it has to do with that much explosive attention seeking, you know, like you said, what, what was the word you used, Fred, like uh, insecure to a certain extent? Well, I, I, most, most like you said, they are insecure and they have two insecure people getting married in an insecure industry. One person's career is flourishing. The other person's show is being canceled. He's moping around, taking out on her. You know, I mean, it happens a lot and happens more prevalently than others. But when they're, uh, uh, again, you know, look at people like Alan Alda. Alan Alda is an actor, been an actor for a lot of years. He and Arlene have been married for over 40 years. Yeah. She is not in the industry. I mean, she writes books and stuff, but she not. But a lot of your people, when you look at some of these people, have been married four and five times to actresses or actors or whatever. And, and Mickey, it, Mickey Rooney. Oh, yeah. Mickey that Rooney, was it. Mickey Marlin, Rooney. Elizabeth Taylor. <laughs> yeah, I, there's a long list. And a lot of these people, that also part of the problem, and, and, and in their defense, and Ed, you know this being in the business, that when you're in that business, you're almost excluded from the lack of life in the normal world. I mean, if somebody, if I, if I were to go into a theater or want to go, go into someone's door, I'm going to be kept out because that per, they think that I'm there for some for a specific reason. Or the opposite you're, with, you know, Fred and myself were in that entertainment business in Hollywood. We've seen it work to the opposite, and I think looking back at it now, it's because these celebrities would like to have a certain amount of a normal life, in quotes, with normal, quote, people. Both Fred and myself were befriended by a few Hollywood, major Hollywood superstars, you know, brought into still their are, inner circle, are. brought into their inner circle, right, Fred? Because I think because we weren't, outside of being text and whatnot, we weren't the Hollywood scene. And they're, they're like, oh, geez, you know, I could sit down and I could talk to these guys because they're just normal people. Well, like one of the people I tell people that Ruta Lee, an actress, you know, is my daughter, my youngest daughter's godmother, who I met at the uh, San Bernardino Th uh, Civic Light Opera Association. She's painting Unsinkable Molly Brown. I treated her like the normal person, and she loved it. And they enjoy that, but a lot of the people they meet, they think, you know, they're afraid that people are going to be superficial to get something out of them. So I, I can see from both sides. The idea that, that you know, like Ed said, we've been friends and, and are still friends. I mean, I have, Ed will tell you, I have several celebrities' phone numbers and, and addresses and cell phone numbers in my cell phone. But I would never call them unless it was for a reason that I needed to call him. I'm not just going to say, hey, well, look, you know, here's so-and-so's number, and Ed, Ed's in the same position. No, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think with me, you know, like the guy I married is a, is a calm, quiet, shy person, and I think a part of that is he balances me. He makes me feel normal. He makes me feel calm, whereas a lot of, I still seek out those exciting people. I still seek out people like me who are very, you know, um, oh, what's a good word? Effervescent, I think, is one people use. That's you know. <laughs> you know, Blacked yeah, loud, loud, obnoxious. Yeah, you know, those, I that's still, you too. Yeah. 
kind of like kind of like the crew here. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, obviously, I still seek out people like us, but I think on the flip side, I need to come home to him. He's he's the he's the quiet place, and I think I think everybody needs a quiet place. And a lot of times, people, especially celebrities, you seek out the spotlight, and so you seek out that brightness and that sort of loud personality. And I think sometimes it can be really explosive. I just think it can be too much. See, I can see celebrities wanting to hang out with normal people, I, although I've never been that level of celebrity, so I can't say for sure. I've always considered myself pretty. I think I would be more the slumming it in the <laughs> in the arrangement. <laughs> I think it's cool you guys have celebrities' numbers in your phone, so yeah. Yeah, it's not so cool. Like Fred said, it doesn't <laughs> it's do not me. So, it's I not so cool. Having a celebrity's phone number in my uh, phone doesn't get me a cup of coffee, a Dunkin' Donuts. So what good is it? And like Ed said, we've met a lot of people in our time and our travels and different jobs we've been at. And you know something? Yeah, they appreciate the fact that we don't bother them. We say hi to them. And I've done that before. Ed's been with me, and especially in New York. We got invited to a special showing of a show by someone's son because we know the guy. But um, And Ed met someone. But, you know, the idea is... It's not Ed, a big deal. No. It's not a big deal because we don't make it a big deal. We don't fawn over these people. They don't want to be fawned over. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's, the, that's the Hollywood Minute on, as we say it. Or the Hollywood 10 Minutes. If you what, what else has been going on this week? Well, this well, is actually... Uh, go ahead, Fred. Well, speaking of... Well, I mean, ho I mean, Hollywood has a lot of stuff going on. So, go ahead. What do you say? Well, no, I was just going to lead into that. I mean, it's been, as far as Hollywood's concerned, as much as go is going on this week, a lot of really exciting personalities died. And actually, our obits this week sort of bled into stories for us because... It just, there's just been so much interesting, so many really interesting people. And the first one we have is Robert Hedges. And Robert Hedges, if you don't know who he is, was the kid that played Epstein in the old show Welcome, Gap, Welcome Back Connor. Died in New Jersey. He lived, he was a longtime New Jersey resident. He died, I believe, in Cranford. And he died of a, he was 60 years old, very, very young. He, he was supposed to, he was, he was, he was uh, met with, with the, uh, he had joined most of the fellow Sweat Hogs and Welcome Back Connor reunion at the 2011 TV Land Awards after Connor Hedges would set out, he was, he was co-star in Cagney and Lacey as Manny Esposito and other works include uh, episode of Love Boat, Chips, News Radio. His last credited role was 2002, hip, edgy, sexy, and cool. Basically, his, his brother Mark told the Star Ledger, the local newspaper, that Robert was retired but still talked about being involved in local arts efforts. He always, he always had those great schemes, his brother said. But last week, I'm not going to do that anymore. Had to survive by three siblings, two children, and two stepchildren. And at one time, he was also a teacher, too. It's kind of funny. It goes full circle. You know, it's funny you uh, happen to mention the, the TV Land Awards because I just happened to be watching that. And when I saw them all on stage together, I didn't know who it was at first. It was someone who was there who it turns out it was Robert Hedges. But at first I didn't know it was him because he was walking with a cane and he had like shoulder length gray hair. Oh, uh, he didn't look good? No, he didn't look good at yeah, all. Yeah, yeah. That's a Actually, shame. Actually, I saw a picture of him. He really, he had, Robert, uh, Bob did not age well at all. But then again, a lot of that comes from the lifestyle and stuff like that, living in New Jersey, things like that, you know. <laughs> yeah, living in New Yeah, Jersey. yeah, we know about that <laughs> lifestyle of living in New Jersey. <laughs> who, who else? But our second actor who passed away was James Farentino. Died of heart failure at 73 years old. He appeared in the You know, I lived under a rock this week because Larry, I think, had mentioned this to me, and I wasn't even aware of it. I Somehow I missed this one. Glad you guys caught it. Well, James Farentino died of, of heart failure at Cedar sinai Medical Center after a long illness. Uh, he starred alongside uh, Kirk Douglas and Martin Sheen in one of my favorite movies, 1980s science fiction film, The Final Countdown, in which he played, in which he played uh, Commander, Commander Richard Owen. And if you like sci-fi, I recommend the movie. It's very, very good. He was also noted for having uh, stalked one of Frank Sinatra's daughters in 1970. <laughs> Tina, I think it was Tina Sinatra. What a thing to be remembered for. It was, it was, it was, it was Tina. Uh, in 1978, he was nominated for an Emmy for the portrayal of St. Peter in a television miniseries, Jesus of Nazareth. Four times divorced, Farentino's tumultuous personal life made headlines, too. In March 1994, he, he had no contest in stalking his ex-girlfriend, Tina Sinatra, daughter of Frank Sinatra. So he's gone, 73 years old, and I don't know if, there's any, if anybody has anything else on it. Danger, Will Robinson. Danger. Danger, Will Robinson. Danger. Dick Tufeld, robot voice in Lost in Space, dies at 85. He was one of the most uh, heard 
disembodied voices, especially from the 1950s, 1970s, announcing or narrating television shows like Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea and commercials for products like Mr. Bubble, Bath, and Gallo Wine, but who's also best for his electronic intonations as the robot in the loopy science fiction series Lost in Space. He died Who are you calling loopy? Season. I'm calling Jason Choke. Oh, sorry. He, he, was in, he lived in the studio section, uh, studio city section of Los Angeles, which I'm very familiar with. Uh, his broadcast began in the 1940s in the radio and reached to, 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 it reached the contemporary age of television on The Simpsons. You know, he did all kinds of stuff. Andy gets you. Uh, Andy yeah, Oakley, busy Zorro. career. Andy, Andy Oakley, Zorro, Peyton Place, Surfside 6, and Bewitched. He worked on a variety of shows uh, starring Red Skelton and Judy Garland and cartoons featuring Bugs Bunny and Garfield. He narrated uh, Walt Disney's Wonderful World of Color and the trailer for the, the Disney film uh, Mary Poppins. He did ads for Zenith wow. Television. Very, it was very prolific. On and on and on. So you were saying that you have some uh, little-known facts about the well, show? Not, not, it's it's uh, obscure facts. The, the, uh, the Jupiter 2, the spaceship and lost in space, for those who don't know, originally launched, and the original series took place in 1968, launched on October 16, 1997, according to the uh, program. Well, the unique thing about that is it's the only television show so far that has actually used a date, a pre-coming date, before that people who have watched the show have actually been able to experience a day. Would have been pretty cool to watch the show on that day. Well, well they did show the episode on that day, and I did I'm watch sure. it. sure. But what happened is that the, 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 the couple of the, they did a, a remake of the show in 1998, and Bill, Bill Mummy was in it. So was uh, John uh, Harris. Yeah, John Harris, that's right. And uh, they uh, were going to be, and John Harris died in 1999. A year before a new remake was going to be coming out of uh, of Lost in Space called Lost in Space: The Journey Home, which was supposed to take film or supposed to be filming in the year 2000, and Earl and Allen canceled the production because of Jonathan Harris's death. So um, you know, there's a lot of things about that. The thing is, uh, what I always wondered: How are they going to do that film if it took off in 1997 and it's now 2012? You can't use the same actors. You've only gone 15 years unless you advance it 40 years. Anything's possible in science fiction. Oh, pfft. yeah, I got to go to an age, an age machine or something. Who knows? I don't know. But that's a fact that I thought was that that, that was a obscure. Yeah, I thought people would like to hear. Oh, and you guys call me a nerd. <laughs> so, so I guess we were opening and closing with little known facts this week, huh? Oh well, got something different. Yeah, what a pleasure to have such interesting, you know, to, it, to be able to celebrate such interesting lives at the end of uh, As We See It. There you go. Some great topics. Uh, yeah, we had some good discussions this week. And I just want to uh, remind everybody that you could all follow us on uh, our website, our brand new website, basenettv.com. It's got everything you possibly want to know there. All of our social media is now on there. All of our prior content is there. Everything you possibly want for BaseNet TV is on our website at BaseNetTV.com, along with, most importantly, a donation tab. Click on that donation on tab on the top of the website. It'll bring you to Google Checkouts, at which you could make a donation for as little as $1.00. By supporting this show with as little as $1, it'll help keep this show or and or any of our other shows in production and help us keep things going along. On, Why they change the name of that to Google Wallet? It's Google Wallet now, yeah, but uh, it's either or. I, I think uh, if uh, I think when you click on it now, it'll actually uh, like on the user end. You as a user, if you were to click on it to make a donation, it'll show up on your end now as Google Wallet. And any donations, you get your name mentioned on the show. Yes, you will be an executive producer of this show if you make a donation. Even for the one dollar donation, we'll make you an executive producer. Let's see, what else do we have? Well, social media, you can find us on Facebook. We are BaseNet. On Google+, Plus, we are BaseNet TV. On Twitter, we are BaseNet TV. We all have our individual Twitter handles and everything, too, so you can follow us there. Just go, again, to BaseNetTV.com, and you'll find all of that information there. I think that's about it. Another exciting adventure here on As We See It. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night.